Hello and welcome to Seven Days of Science. Except it's not Seven Days of Science because we're in Morocco. Except it is. Moroccan because Seven it's Days still of Science. Seven Days of Science. Okay, well but she... it's not the same because it's in Morocco. If anyone gets that reference, can we give them a Patreon for free? No. All right. Ignore her. It is Seven Days of Science. You're not on the wrong place. Uh, what have we got this week? In the headlines this week, whale song. Whale song? Structure oh, yeah. similar to human language. That's cool. Uh, Cannibalism. That's always fun. And a giant radio burst from a quasar from the early universe. That's boring. You're just... All science is interesting. That's good. That sounded... Yeah. Try to show <laughs> me up then. All science. Not hard. <laughs> While you look forward to that, you can also look forward to this. The Benji Thomas Morocco Special, coming to screen near you in the next couple of years. Probably. It might come out before South Africa. What, the country? Our top story this week is the amazing news of a study which has found humpback whale's song to have a statistical structure similar to that of human language. Only male humpbacks produce song, which travels through the water for many miles and is thought to be a way for the whales to attract females. Every year, these songs have been documented increasing in complexity, which might be a way for these males to seem more appealing to potential mates. Plus, in the southwestern Pacific Ocean, an entirely new humpback song usually starts up every few years, which then quickly spreads to many different individuals across the Pacific. This whale song is therefore clearly a culturally transmitted behavior, similar to human languages. That's already fascinating, but now researchers have analyzed eight years worth of humpback whale song recordings and found that they have some remarkable similarities in structure to human languages. One pattern that seems to be universal among different languages is that the most common word occurs twice as often as the second most common, three times as often as the third most common, and so forth. In English, then, this means that the word the occurs twice as much as the word of, and three times as much as the word and. Well, turns out that distinct humpback whale song subsequences also follow this distribution. In addition, another law of languages states that the most common words will be among the shortest in the language. And once again, the most frequent whale song subsequences are short ones. These common features shared between the songs and speech of two very distantly related species therefore suggest that such linguistic properties may naturally arise as they enable the animals to easily learn the languages. In a story that we missed from last week, a study has been published that reveals that bonobos are able to engage in a particularly advanced social behaviour that had previously been thought to only occur in humans, the ability to pick up gaps in someone else's knowledge. In this experiment, three cups were placed between a human and a bonobo. A second human would come along and place a treat for the ape under one of the three cups, sometimes with the first human looking and sometimes when the first human clearly did not see. The first human would then ask where the treat was and then wait 10 seconds. If this human had seen the treat being placed under one of the three cups, then the bonobo would usually sit and wait patiently to receive the treat. If the human did not see the treat being placed underneath one of the cups, then the bonobo would point at the cup the treat was placed under, sometimes rather excitedly indeed. This is a massive development in our understanding of the social capabilities of other species. It is the first time another species has been recorded understanding and acting on the ignorance of another, which is an incredibly important social tool in many of the more advanced social behaviours that are completely unique to humans. In other news, the biggest ever radio jet in the early universe has been discovered. In a collaboration between scientists at the Gemini North Low Frequency Array Telescope and the Hobby Eberly Telescope, this massive expulsion comes from a quasar from billions of years ago, when the universe was just 1.2 billion years old. These kinds of radio bursts have been particularly elusive from this time in our universe history, and the researchers were particularly surprised by the size of the quasar emanating this burst. It's only around 450 million times the mass of our sun, which is of course incredibly massive, but still much smaller than we may expect from a quasar that produces a radio burst this big. The radio burst spans at least 200 
1,000 light years. That's double the width of our own Milky Way galaxy. This colossal size is part of the reason why we can see it. The presence of cosmic microwave background radiation is often attributed to the difficulty astronomers have with detecting early radio bursts. How radio jets this size formed is still a pressing question, however. But this research brings us one step further to one day answering that question. First up in this week's exciting paleontology news, a paper describes an exceptional fossil of a prehistoric marine reptile with preserved skin impressions. This incredible fossil from Germany dates to around 183 million years ago during the early Jurassic. It's a kind of plesiosaur and it's a beautifully complete specimen preserving the whole skeleton. In addition to the bones, there are detailed skin traces around the tail and a front flipper. Very interestingly, the skin of the tail lacks any scales, whereas the skin of the flipper has many small sub-triangular scales that resemble those of modern reptiles such as turtles and crocs. Amazingly, the skin around the tail also retains identifiable melanosomes which are organelles responsible for making the pigment melanin. Plus, there are kinds of skin cells with nuclei still intact, and the different layers of the skin are very clearly preserved too. The difference in skin type across the body, with small scales being present on the flippers but not on the tail, also seems to indicate that plesiosaur skin was similar to other seagoing reptiles such as sea turtles, which have a similar condition. The function of these flipper scales may have been to help protect the appendages during seafloor grazing, in which the plesiosaur might have filtered through seabed sediment to search for prey, and could have used its flippers to drag itself along. An absolutely brilliant discovery, adding to our understanding of these reptiles' appearance and possible behaviours. Also in the paleo news, a fossilised skull of a prehistoric bird has been discovered in Antarctica that has revealed how exactly this ancient bird lived and how it's related to modern birds. The skull belongs to a species named Vegavis aii, and it was a foot-propelled diving bird that lived some 69 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. Before now, only fragmentary bits of the skull of Vegavis had been uncovered. So this new skull is an exciting find that tells scientists much more about this animal. The skull anatomy has been used to confirm that the Vegavis can be definitively classified within the waterfowl lineage, something that had been controversial previously. There are also some differences to modern waterfowl, as Vegavis has a narrow and pointed beak, but with attachments for powerful jaw musculature. However, they're quite similar to those of modern diving birds, such as grebes, and loons, which hunt prey underwater. This therefore suggests that the waterfowl lineage experimented with various differing lifestyles early on in their evolution, and Vegavis was likely an underwater pursuit predator. Another remarkable new find. In the archaeology news this week, Paleolithic artefacts found in the Levangine caves have been found to be engraved with geometric patterns. The researchers investigated the marks on five artefacts found in various sites from the Middle Paleolithic from 300,000 to 50,000 years ago. 3D surface analysis used to distinguish deliberate from functional marks on a Lavalwa core from the Monet cave and on a flake and retouch blade from the Amud cave. The analysis confirms the marks on the core from the Monet cave were indeed deliberate and geometric. The incisions are set either parallel or perpendicular to the edge of the tool or the topography of the tool's planes, and all marks follow the same alignment. The incisions on the Amud tools, however, are noticeably shallower with no clear pattern and are more consistent with marks from use. In addition, they looked at previously published specimens from the Kavza and Kanitra, but while the Monet cave artifact marks were considered deliberate, the Amud, Kavza and Kanitra marks are a result of their environment. This study challenges the view that early hominins were not capable of abstract or symbolic thought, offering instead evidence of deliberate symbolic markings. What a fantastic study. And finally for the news, a team of archaeologists have discovered evidence of cannibalism in ancient Magdalenian people. The Magdalenian people are a later culture of people from the Upper Paleolithic of Western Europe, between 23 and 11,000 years ago. The team studied bone material from a cave in Poland, originally excavated between the 19th century and the late 1960s. Due to the state of the bones, a positive human identification was difficult at the time, but the specimens have since been confirmed to be human and have been dated to approximately 18,000 years old. And their analysis of the bone and cut marks on the bone strongly suggested the consumption of human 
human flesh. There is a history of well-documented human body manipulation among the Magdalenian culture, and it's thought to potentially be a part of funerary rites. Studies of these practices have suggested cannibalism as being a part of this, but this idea has been challenged. This new research, however, presents previously unpublished evidence of human consumption. The findings were supported by similar behavior observed in cultures at a similar time, and the human remains being found among animal remains bearing the same cut marks. It is possible that this is just part of another rite, however, and no cannibalism was involved. Hopefully, some future evidence will help us solve this mystery once and for all. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. By the way, if you're a fan of science and cool notebooks, then be sure to check out the amazing designs by Atoms to Astronauts and use our affiliate link in the description below to get 10% off. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. On our Patreon you can gain access to bonus content including our discussions on our favourite science stories of the past month. To give you a taste of what we get up to over there, we'll be making the January monthly discussion public on the 7 Days of Science channel. As always, a big thank you to our Patreons, including Andrew Cowan, Clara, Clara Middleton, Middleton Drugs Drugs Rivers Rivers Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotis, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Rose, Matt Grandis, Manikin Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Thomas, Sammy Voss, Staniforth Hopkins, Timothy and Ted Rowe, and Troy Schmidt. Schmidt. Thanks Thank for watching, watching and we'll see you next week. week. You were fine, and then the last <laughs> bit. <laughs>